Good morning, everybody. It is nice to see you once again on this beautiful Sunday morning that God has given to us, another day that He has added to our lives, another opportunity that He has given to us to serve Him, to worship Him and to serve Him this morning. Just a couple of quick announcements this morning. Uh, Adrian, after your announcements, just has an announcement of his own to make. Uh, the singing Tuesday night is at Antoinette My House, okay, 6.30. It's uh, singing and fellowship. Please keep that in mind. Then the, we have a fellowship uh, meal afterwards this morning. And then again in March, the 1st of March. Okay. We're doing it at the end of this month because we had one in the middle of December. We have it at the end of this month. So in February we're not going to have one the first, well, first, week, first Sunday in March. We're going to have the next fellowship meal. Then Bible study uh, has resumed on Sundays. Okay, 9:30. Okay, 9:30. Tani Stephanie, get your word. Right, did everybody get that? 9:30 Sunday morning Bible study. Um, if you're not yet aware of it. You've missed a couple of months of Matthew already, but I think by this time everybody knows that we're in Matthew. Are there any other announcements? As far as that is my announcement goes, there are no birthdays, anniversaries this month. We have another three days of January left, and then the first month of 2024 is done and dusted. Right, any other announcements? Anything that I've missed? <coughs> no other announcements. Alright, if there are no other announcements, let us open then our services. Yes, sorry, Adria. Okay, I don't want to make this announcement we want to worship opening prayer that's started. <laughs> um, they're not going to get that up. I've had uh, a few statements made to me that they did that quiz, but they can't get the answers or they didn't get enough answers, and I posted it twice that you don't have to know, so I can't go with those non-official entries. So can I ask Lynn to come forward, please? She was the only one that sent me the full list. So we are not going to have the second Afrikaans mense, knap gedaan, uh, look after that, I put all the money together for the second and third prize. Maya dankie en genede diens. I didn't, I didn't see any more answers because I didn't think it, I didn't think it was going to be fair. Uh, I love that quiz. I actually I love those questions. A uh, couple of those things I to, to, you really have to think about. You know the answer, you've seen it somewhere before, and uh, you really, really have to think about that one. Yes, sir? Google and your cell phones and everything for everybody in the future is allowable. Is allowable. Or I say that we are not allowed to look up the answer. <laughs> it's like shooting the news. All right, so Google is allowed. So, so next, next time there's no excuse for not having the answers. All right, Google knows everything. Sit around the table with your family and work them all out. Also, also, okay. uh, Google knows everything. Not to say that Google is always right about everything. All okay, right, so just always keep that in mind. All right, let's open with the word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us, for the opportunity that you've given to us again to be able to assemble here this morning. Father, for the good night's rest that we were able to enjoy, that we were able to wake up this morning, Father, and that we were able to assemble here. Father, we thank you for everything that you daily do for us, for all the blessings that you bestow on us. Father, we, oh, we know and 
are aware of the, the fact that we take so many things that you give us as we take them for granted, Father. So, Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for everything that you do for us. We thank you for bringing us together as brothers and sisters this morning. We thank you for the common faith that we share in your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, Lord. For the calling that with which you have called each and every one of us and the obedience to that call that, that we have made. And that bond that we share, Lord, as brothers and sisters in your name, to be able to come before you and to not only call you Father, but also to call Jesus Christ our brother. We thank you for all of these blessings, Lord. We thank you for all of the things that we so often take for granted. We take our, our health and our youth and all of these things for granted. We think of those that are advanced in age and the infirmities that come with that. We think of those amongst our number that are sick. We think especially of as a Myrella. And Lord, we are grateful that she is feeling better this morning. We are also grateful for Adrian and Gabby that is also feeling better. For our prayers that were answered in, in that regard. Father and Lord, we ask you also to be with Tony Betty and Tony Stephanie, Lord, and also Auntie Shirley. All of the older ladies in our congregation and Auntie Lynn, Lord, all of these beautiful people, Lord, all of these ladies that we love so dearly, we ask you to be with them, Father. We ask you also to be with us. This morning, as we go into our worship service, we think of those that could not be with us this morning. We ask you to be with them and to return them to us at the next appointed time. Father, we ask you to be with us and to lead us this morning in our worship to you, that it is not only done today, Father, that we are not only just Christians today, but that we take it out in our lives, that for this whole week that lies before us, we ask your guidance, and we also ask your, you to lead us, Father. Make us always mindful of whose we are. And Father, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One word rejoicing, I pray by way.
morning church. As we come around the Lord's table today and we gather here, we are in remembrance of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and what He did and went for us. We live our lives on a daily basis and the true preparation for death is made when we live each and every day. It is as though we live a life that is worthy of Christ and that we should live not sure of tomorrow and yesterday is gone. So we live every day as a one outstanding complete little life. If you wake up tomorrow and God blesses you, like Reynolds said, you just open up your eyes, but you will be blessed with breath tomorrow, then we will tackle tomorrow as though well it is our last day and as we live. And it should be a miniature life of the completeness in itself. It was a good Bible study this morning about worry and do not worry because nothing is going to change. God is in control, He's always been in control and having given Christ is His part and plan of salvation. It has its own allotment in our life. What do we do for Christ? For Jesus that has died for us, our mission is to find that bit, that bit of the vine. What did you do, I do, we do for Christ in this past week? Except maybe worry about the things that we need to deal with and the things and how they stand and how the scriptures are plain and not plain apart from worrying. And that is what devours our time where we are not doing the work of the Lord. And I'm going to ask again that you answer yourself. What did you do this week for Christ? It would be quite interesting if you put down a full scrap of paper and you lay it down beside you and think, what did you do for Christ? Not for one another or put up a fight or an argument or a worry. But what did you do? We must live and we must live our days well. Our days will make for completed weeks, then months and then years. Each day prepares for the next and the last day prepares for eternal glory. If we thus live coming up to the end of our life, we need not to have terror in us, but dying does not interrupt life for one minute. Think about that, that. If we are living for Christ, if we are doing His work, then when we die, we are just exiting and entering. It need not even be an interruption. We need have only one key, and that is that we live well. Not about all the other worries that is going on, but just that we live well. Our one short life as we go on, that we love God and our neighbor, that we believe on Christ and obey His commandments, that we do each duty as it comes to our hand, and that we do it. There will be no sudden coming to an end that will surprise us if we are unprepared. And then while glad to live as long as it may be God's will to leave us here, we shall welcome the gentle angel who comes with great joy to lead us into our eternal rest. Let us live. Revelation 2.10 is very clear that if we Endure to the end that we shall receive the gift of life. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you 
and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. And as I have said, but be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. We are to set ourselves a heavenly mindset. I'm going to go through Colossians 3 quickly. Colossians 3 verses 1 through to 4 and just carry on a little bit through that. Christians remember that we are going to heaven. Very, very soon, at any moment, we will be hastened away from all you've known here and to take on eternal hope. You will wake up to find your lungs full with the air of a better country, Hebrews 11, 16. Your sorrows and your signs will be out of sight, Isaiah chapter 51, verse 11. And you will see Jesus face to face one day, Philippians 1, 23, and with him you will be in hope, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. If we belong to Christ then, we will live here on earth, but then, there in heaven. You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. Nor is your life in Christ on full display now, but only then. Verses 3. When Christ, with your life, appears, you will appear with Him in glory. Verse 5. 4. Your life is wonderfully, intrinsically, eternally bound up with Jesus Himself, who reigns there and who will appear there, and heavenly mindedness aligns us with that fact, teaching us to define our identity, not by the person we see in the mirror, but by the Savior that we see in Scripture. And that goes for each and every one of us in our daily lives, to understand that Christ who died for us, it is to live in us and to give us this eternal hope. Christ will be the judge one day. When the great day of the Lord is at your doorstep one day, it is in Christ. It is what we have put to death and what we have chosen to put to life. It is what our own dressing is, is on our bodies and in our nature and as to how we have treated people. They dress themselves in the heavenly clothing of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Verses 12. And we need to forgive. Remember that Christ's prayer, John 17, specifically when He prays for unity. Christ died for unity. Christ died for the church. Christ prayed for unity. Colossians 3 clearly states that we should forgive one another and live in harmony, to live in unity. This forgiveness that Paul talks about here is very clear that he talks about the gospel and the people that are entering his church. He's talking about in his day, the heathen, the Hebrew, the everybody, the Israelites, the Jews, the Gentiles, the masters, the slaves, the prisoners, the prison himself got baptized into Christ. So he's talking about a wide scope of people. That is what Paul is talking about here, is to forgive. Remember just the previous chapter, he talks about to be clothed with Christ. So he's talking about members in the church to accept one another. And once again, he's preaching about unity so that we can live in harmony. Because we are not all the same. I'm a proper boon and some people call me Dutchman and then we have the German Rhino thing. We are not the same. And we don't understand each other. We don't understand each other's upbringing. And this is what Paul is talking about. To live in harmony and to forgive one another in their shortcomings. They walk under the reign of divine peace which was established. It's thrown on their hearts. Verse 15. They speak and they sing with the harmony of gratitude. In every relationship, in every word, in every deed, they seek to show the glory of Christ. They are like oaks with their roots deep into the ground. In the same ground we are. Some of them, the winds and the storm 
leads against, some withstand, and some don't. It depends on what you do with your roots. They daily draw nourishment from another world, and so bear the fruit of that better country, if I may put it that way. Christ died for each and every one of us. We live in Him. We live like Him. We are imitating Him. And we are growing humbly in Him. I want to leave you with that and again ask the question that are you growing humbly in Him? We need to grow. We need to spend time in the Scripture and we need to appreciate what the Lord has done for us. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, Father, the down your table, Lord, for your death and burial and resurrection, Father, for everything and the stripes that you have borne for us, that you have paid this price, Father, for us. We pray, Father, also for unity. We pray also, Father, for understanding. And we pray, Father, that we will always look to you for the example and live our lives every day, Father, for you. Father, we thank you now for the bread. We thank you, Father, that it represents your body. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we can just cast our minds on everything that you have so graciously given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mighty God, Father, we bow humbly before you. Father, we continually thank you, Father, for getting our sins on the cross. We pray, Father, that we will abide in the truth and in your word and that we will grow as we study. Father, we pray for unity for which you have prayed. We pray, Father, sincerely for one another. We pray for the church. In Christ's name we say thank you for your blood. Amen. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross He suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer, worth His blood.
Our lesson this morning is entitled A Heart After God's Heart. A Heart After God's Heart. The section that we will be looking at is 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. Who does not like a compliment? I think all of us like compliments. It was Mark Twain who said that he could live a whole month on a good compliment. And as a Christian, I cannot think of any higher compliment than to be described as a man or a woman after God's heart. When that compliment comes from God Himself, we need to sit up and take notice. Here is a person whose life we can all profit by studying. Such was God's description of David. This is a man after my own heart. Acts 13.22 and 1 Samuel 13.14 Now why would God put such a high <clears throat> affirmation on this man? And how can we be a person after God's heart like David had? You recall that David was anointed as king by the prophet Samuel while he was still a teenager. He did not assume the throne until he was 30 years old. <coughs> he was probably in his late teens when he killed the, guy, the giant Goliath. He probably wrote Psalms 23 and other songs while he was still a teenager tending his father's sheep. The trials that David went through at the hand of Saul occurred while David was in his twenties. So his life contains many instructions for those on the younger side of life. It is especially important for us today because a lot of people think that teenagers are supposed to rebel. And we expect it, and it oftentimes becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But it is not the biblical law. In Scripture there are many examples, David being one of them, of young people with a heart for God. Sure, David lacked the wisdom that comes from experience, he needed trials to refine and mature him. There were sins of his youth that he would later regret in Psalms 25 verse 7. But God began to use David in a very significant way while he was still in his twenties or in his teens. This morning we will look at four qualities that marked David as a young man with his heart after God's heart. Qualities that we must and can develop in order to be men and women after God's heart. To have a heart after God's heart, we must be converted, be spiritful, spend time alone with God, and be obedient in small things. So the first thing is to be, or to have a heart after God's heart, we must be converted. It is crucial to establish from the outset that, or the fact that David was not by nature a man after God's heart. He did not possess some inherent goodness <clears throat> that made God choose him. In Psalm 51 verse 5, David declares and he says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. We by nature 
are all sinners in rebellion against God. We are all self-willed and self-seeking rather than seeking after God's will. Romans 3, 9 through 12 and verse 23. No one deserves anything from God but judgment and punishment. And David was not right before God by any of his own deeds. In Psalms 32 verse 1 and 2, David writes, and he says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. The Apostle Paul quotes these verses in Romans 4, 7 through 8, in the context of arguing that no one is right before God by their own good works. Rather, it is by faith in God. So we would be off on the wrong track to assume that David, by his own will and by his own power, and his own effort was a man after God's heart. And that God chose him on that basis from the outset. But rather conversion is a work of God. And he performed that work in David's heart. David didn't choose God. God chose David. God took him from the sheepfold where he was tending his father Jesse's flocks and he made him the shepherd of his people. Psalm 78 verse 70 and 71. <clears throat> While 1 Samuel 16 has no reference to David's or has reference to David's anointing as king, not to his conversion, but God chooses those whom the world often overlooks and rejects. Samuel would rather have picked one of Jesse's older sons, one of David's older brothers, instead of him. Even David's own father didn't consider his youngest son enough of a candidate to call him in from the fields for this important meeting with the prophet Samuel. But David was God's choice. Even so, God chooses for salvation whom the world would reject so that none can boast before God, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31. Satan would want nothing better than for us to think we are converted when we are in fact not. So how do we know that we are truly converted? Paul exhorts us in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 and he says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Peter tells us, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. 2 Peter 1 verse 10. Scripture gives us a number of tests to see whether our faith is genuine or false. You can, for instance, look at the whole book of 1 John. A truly converted person will be sensitive to and turning away from sin. 1 John 1, 5-10. He will be growing in obedience and in love for God's people. 1 John 2, 1 through 11. He will be growing in the knowledge and love of God's truth as revealed in His Word. 1 John 2, 21 through 27. So in short, we should be learning to turn from self-seeking 
and instead to seek the things of God. Luke 9.23-24 And there's one further thing that a Christian or a truly converted person will not be apathetic about the things of God. Those who are complacent do not need and do not see their need for God. But God says that these people do not know their true condition. God says that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And He will spit them out of His mouth unless they repent. Revelation 3, 15 through 19. David was a young man after God's heart because he had been truly converted by God. Everything else is built on this. To have a heart after God's heart, secondly, we must be spiritual. Note 1 Samuel 16, 13. Before Pentecost, the Spirit of God did not permanently indwell believers as it does in the present age. Rather, he came to upon certain ones, enabled them to fulfill their roles and their tasks. He also could not, or he also could and did leave those who did not walk uprightly. 1 Samuel 16, 14 and Psalms 51 verse 11. When Samuel anointed David for the throne, the Spirit of God came mightily upon him from that day forward. And David was a markedly different young man because of the Holy Spirit. If we are truly converted, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Romans 8, 9. But if we are tolerating sin in our life, or we are living to please ourselves and rather than God, we are quenching or grieving the Spirit. We must confess all known sin and yield consciously and continually to the Holy Spirit so that He will produce His fruit in our life. Galatians 5, 16 through 23. A good question to ask is, if the Holy Spirit were to withdraw from my life, how long would it take me to miss Him? If the Holy Spirit were to withdraw from my life, how long will it take me to miss Him? Am I so routine, so self-dependent that I could go on for weeks and never realize that the Spirit had departed? Also, we need to realize that a prime mark of a spirit-filled life is not miraculous signs or wonders, but rather the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, and also a joyful endurance in trials, Colossians 1, 11 through 12. To be a man or a woman after God's heart, we must be truly converted and we must walk daily in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, to have a heart after God's heart, we must spend time alone with God. David was out in the fields tending his father's sheep when a messenger came running to him and said, The prophet Samuel is with your family. <laughs> And he wants you to come. They had to send someone to David to fetch him. That is how unimportant his family thought he was. So David went and to everyone's bewilderment, Samuel anointed David to succeed Saul as king of Israel. 1 Samuel 16 verse 1 through 13. I doubt anyone except Samuel understood at that time the full significance of that act. But they knew it had to mean something. Samuel 
went back to Ramah, verse 13. And where did David go? Where did David go? The anointed king, where did he go? Verse 19, he went back to tending his father's sheep. And what did he do out in those fields while he was tending the sheep? Fortunately, he didn't have an iPad or an iPod, or we won't have the Psalms that we have today. Rather, David used that time to develop his relationship with God. Psalms 23, David probably wrote or flowed out of the quiet times that he had with God. Psalm 19 may have been written while we were sitting out in the fields meditating on God's revelation through creation. He also used that time to, ve to develop his skills as a musician. Psalm 1 Samuel 16, 18. Expressing his feelings of love and adoration to God through the Psalms. If you're married with children, you will probably have to fight time or fight to find time alone with God. Some people can't stand to be alone. They fill every moment with noise from radio or TV. They feel the need to be constantly around people. But we won't grow in the things of God unless we spend time alone with God. So let us make four practical suggestions on how we can spend time alone with God. And the first one is learn to read. Learn to read. Learning or reading is a learned skill. Even if you aren't good at it now, you can learn it. Perhaps by taking a reading course online or by finding a book on how to read. But once you read, it opens up the scriptures from not only the Bible, but also from godly men who have wrote books about the Bible. So the question arises, what should we read? Well, first and foremost, we should read the Bible. Read it over and over again. Read it from cover to cover. George Muller read his Bible over 200 times. He read the, Old Test the Hebrew Old Testament seven times. And as you read it, don't just read it to check off a thing to do on your list. Read prayerfully asking God to reveal Himself and to show you your own heart with a view to obedience. If you have never done it before, now would be a good time to start reading the entire Bible in a year. Become a reader and your heart after God will grow. The second point is learn to pray. Use time alone with communion in, with God. Read and pray through the Psalms, which reflects David's communion with God. Study the Lord's Prayer. Study the prayers of Paul and use them as models. Keep a prayer list. Learn to commune with God in prayer. Thirdly, learn to worship. Our public worship on Sunday should be an overflow of our private worship. Learn to adore God and marvel at His love in time alone with Him. Express yourself by singing. And I think a lot of times it would be a good time to be alone for this one. We forget oftentimes that the Psalms were not just poems, they were put to music. God seeks those to worship Him. Fourth thing is learn to think. 
You can think or you can't think if you're never alone with God. Learn to evaluate life in light of His Word. Think through current events, the things that you have read, things that others say, your current circumstances, your goals, your family's needs in light of God's truth. To have a heart after God's heart, we must be converted, spirit-filled, spend time alone with God, and then finally to have a heart after God's heart, we must be obedient in small things. The first time that we encountered David, he was tending his father's sheep. A job that his older brothers looked down on, 1 Samuel 7:28. Even David's own father didn't consider him important enough to invite him to the meeting with the prophet Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 11. But God saw David's faithfulness in this seemingly unimportant task that David was doing. It was a part of his apprenticeship leading him to the point that he could lead the people of God, Psalm 78, 70 through 72. David took his job very seriously. When a predator attacked, David didn't just shrug his shoulders and say, oh well, I'm not going to risk my neck for some dumb sheep. Rather, it tells us that David went after it and rescued it. 1 Samuel 17, 34, 35. Later Saul heard of David's skill as a musician and summoned him to the palace. I'm sure that as David played his harp out in the fields, he never dreamed that he would someday play the harp before the mighty King Saul. But when David did, it served him well in this more important task, 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 23. And then came the war with the Philistines. David's older brothers went with Saul to the battlefield. But where was David? David was back tending his father's sheep and serving as an errand boy for his father Jesse, 1 Samuel 17, 14 and 15. When Jesse wanted David to go find out about his brother's well-being, he carefully made provisions for it by, having fi by finding someone else to tend his father's sheep while he was away. And he obeyed his father without complaint. When David got to the battlefront and he heard Goliath's blasphemous challenge, he began to ask some questions of the soldiers. And this threatened David's oldest brothers who put David down with a sarcastic question in 1 Samuel 17 verse 28. Asking him, why are you here? You're lazy. You're wicked. You're just coming here to see who's looking after our own poor father's few sheep that he has. David could have easily returned insult for insult. Some battle, you coward. You're just standing here, cowering before this giant Goliath and his blasphemous challenges. To the nation of Israel. But instead David held his tongue. 1 Samuel 17, 29-30. He was learning obedience in his speech. 1 Samuel 16, 18. None of these things by themselves represent a big deal. But they all combine to show that the teenager David was learning to become obedient to God 
in the small, insignificant situations where God placed them. David did not become arrogant or boastful when he was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king. He could have said, I'm not going back to those silly sheep. Get a servant to go and do it. Or I'm not your errant boy. I am the future king. He humbly and quietly fulfilled his duties. Obedience in small things does not seem like much, but a rope of great strength is made up of all the tiny little strands <coughs> that are all woven together. We all tend to sit around and wish that God would use us for some great or important task, like killing Goliath. Not realizing that it is obedience in the small things, the small everyday menial tasks that God puts before us, that weave together, that make a rope strong enough to bring down the giant Goliath. The moral fiber that enables us to attack and defeat the huge problems in life is made up of those small little strands of obedience. The little moral choices that confront us daily. Integrity, controlling wrong thoughts, guarding our speech, controlling anger, submitting to authority. Do we want God's supreme compliment apply to us that we are a person after God's heart. Make sure that we are truly converted. Depend consciously each day on the Holy Spirit. Spend time often alone with God and practice obedience in the small things that God has given us to do. That's how God developed David from becoming a poor, nothing shepherd boy to becoming, to be becoming one of the greatest kings of Israel. Every person who has a heart after God's heart must walk in the same way. Jesus
Father, as we are also parting our ways, we pray that you will keep your hand over us. And Father, as we fellowship around a meal this morning, we pray, Father, for your blessings on the food and for everything, Father, that we can join today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.